Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Scher. Today, I'm joined by Trey Suntrup. Now, Trey is a little unique in that he is a PhD in physics. I can't say I've had any physics PhDs on this podcast so far, but but stick with me. So he got his PhD in physics at University of Santa Barbara. Um, then he got into uh, translational science and entrepreneurship, where he did a fellowship in that at Washington University in St. Louis. And since then, he has been involved in different startups, different companies to basically develop products to bridge the gap between the science and translating it into things that we can use that make our lives better. Well, now uh, he's working with a company and you can find more about him at mybiosense.com where they are working on ketone monitors. Um, And he was actually the lead author on a paper, um, which as you'll hear, provided more than two and a half times the data that already previously existed correlating blood and breath meters. And so he's he's got a wealth of knowledge about ketone monitoring in general and s- specifically about um, breath monitors. So we go into all that. We talk about the basics about what ketones are, why we should measure them. And then we go into the details about the pluses and minuses and the intricacies of all the different testing uh, methodologies and talk about what's coming uh, in the future, how it relates to diet, how it relates to fasting. So Hopefully this is true statement, but everything you wanted to know and more about ketone testing coming up now with Trey Centra. Well, Trey Suntrup, welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast. Hey, Brad. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm excited to talk all things ketone measuring and ketone monitoring. And you are sort of uniquely qualified to do this. I mean, you've got your PhD in physics, so that tells me you know your science. You know how to interpret science well, but you've also got years of experience in product development and translational science. So really sort of bridging the gap between what what the science says and sort of the practical applications of things. And that's really what I want to talk about today. So you ready to dig in and get started? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. So first let's talk about ketones. I mean, let's start from the basic. Like what are ketones? Because we talk about ketones as if they're one thing, right? So many people just say ketones and, and most people know the difference, but why don't we just take a step back and review the different types of ketones, how they're similar, how they're different, and then we can get into the monitoring process. Yep. That sounds great. So I think from the very highest level, we can talk about two different types of energy substrates for the body, right? So two different types of energy. So on the one hand, you have glucose, which of course everybody is familiar with and is used to. Um, And on the other hand, you have fat. So your body likes to burn glucose first if it's available, right? So if you're eating a lot of carbohydrate, you have a lot of uh, your blood sugar is reasonably high, your body is going to burn that source first. Once that gets depleted, and then once the stored glucose in your body or the glycogen gets depleted, you start tapping into your fat stores right? So your body starts to metabolize fat for energy because there's no more glucose left to burn. And one of the byproducts of that fat metabolism process are, or is this molecule, molecule called ketones, right? So as you say, there's really not one ketone, there's actually three. Um, and the, uh, they're produced in your liver uh, as a byproduct of fat metabolism. So as a, a molecule of fat is metabolized, your body produces a molecule called acetoacetate. Right. So that's really the first kind of parent ketone we like to call it. Right. So acetoacetate um, can turn into two different molecules. One of them is called beta hydroxybutyrate, and the other is acetone. Right. So those are the three uh, ketones. And they're all related to each other in these kind of really interesting ways that we can get into later. Uh, But those are the three primary ketone bodies. The important thing to remember is that of all the different ways to measure ketones, they're all sensitive to one of those three ketone bodies, right? So I don't know if you want to get into the different measurement methods yet, or you want to talk a little bit more about the physiology, but those are the three ketone bodies. Yeah, and I think that's important, and we definitely will get into that, how each one sort of has its own mode of measurement, and, and that, that could be important. But but before we get into that, let's now talk about, okay, we know what ketones, we know what the where they come from, what they are. Why do we want to measure them? What Like what benefits is it for measuring a ketone body? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that a healthy metabolism is one that can actually switch between this glucose burning state and this fat burning state. So I think a lot of folks know and appreciate that when you you have an excess of glucose in your blood and you're always burning glucose, uh, 
that there's some adverse effects um, to your body when you're doing that. So there's inflammation that occurs, high blood pressure, kidney disease, diabetes, all those things when your blood sugar gets too high. Um, in addition, you tend to gain weight, right? Because if you have all this excess glucose, your body eventually ends up storing this as fat and your fat stores burn up, build up, excuse me, in your body, right? So there's a lot of evidence that suggests that occasionally you want to deplete the glucose in your body and your stored glucose and switch over to this fat metabolism state. So this switching um, is, is very healthy for the body and is a sign of healthy metabolism. So how do you know if you're burning fat though, right? It's, it's not easy to tell always. And the scale is not a great indicator for a bunch of different reasons, um, not least of which is that it can't tell you if you're burning fat this moment. It can tell you over the course of you know a couple of days or weeks or months if you have been, but it doesn't give you that instant feedback about is your body burning fat or not. And that's really where ketones come in. That's really where measuring ketones comes in. Because any time that your body is metabolizing fat, you're going to be producing ketones. Yeah, that's a great point. So it's basically the surrogate for a fat burning metabolism. And, and you mentioned, you know, there's evidence to suggest sometimes we want to deplete the glucose and switch to fat burning. I'd say that maybe more than sometimes, maybe yeah. even all the time. So, but the, your point is well taken that, that it is a measurement of fat burning. So if you want to be burning fat, which we can talk about the benefits of that, or we, you know, I've sort of talked about that a lot on this podcast, but if you want to measure it, what ways can we measure it in the moment? Ketones are definitely one. Are there other ways to measure if you're burning fat in the moment? Um, there are certain other surrogates that are uh, slightly less perfect than, than ketones. So for example, you could measure um, respiratory quotient, like carbon dioxide to oxygen ratio, right? Uh, this is uh, complicated for several reasons, not least of which is that that measurement is typically a laboratory measurement where you have to, you know, lay on your back for 30 minutes before to kind of let everything equalize uh, to get an accurate measurement there. And there really haven't been any portable tools that have been able to reproduce the accuracy of those lab tools. So in principle, can you tell, you know, if you're primarily burning carbohydrate or primarily burning fat from respiratory quotient measurement? Yes, absolutely. Um, but you have to, you know, go into a lab and lay down on and do the metabolic heart measurement and the whole thing. So, um, but that is another way that you could do it aside from uh, measuring ketones. But ketones are a more direct measurement, right? Because they're produced yeah. as a direct byproduct of the fat metabolism process. Right. I think I'm going to have a whole nother podcast on metabolic carts and, and, and uh, testing like that. But I remember I did one of those uh, exercise tests where they measure the, the your respiratory quotient while you're breathing and you wear that big mask and it's, and then when you take the mask off, like all your spit drips out, it was, it was kind of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but that's, I, I digress. It was kind of cool to learn, but you're right. Like you can't go through that at, at the moment every day. So that's where the ketone test is really is beneficial. So one of the things that, that can get confusing for some people though, is saying, okay, if I'm going to eat a low carb diet, I need to test my ketones to make sure I'm getting health benefits. Now, would you say that that is an accurate statement or not? Um, I think it is to a degree, right? Because people's bodies are different. So everybody's body is going to react differently to a certain stimulus. So you could have a certain lifestyle change, like you could start exercising in a certain way, or you could start eating a certain macronutrient content. But really the only way to know how that's affecting your individual metabolism is to take a measurement, right? So, cause we've seen folks actually go on exactly the same macro content and because they're different age, maybe different gender, different, um, you know, metabolic, uh, history, like health history, they just have wildly different reactions to the same stimulus. Right. And that's something that I think people are starting to appreciate more and more. And this is the age of personalized medicine, right? When people mm -hmm. are getting into genetics and genomics and all this stuff, right? Things being hyper personalized. And I think that this is a great example of that. This is a great example of how, you know, individual bodies react differently and the best way to know how your specific body and your specific metabolism is reacting to these inputs is to measure. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, but again, I think it's important to, to differentiate that you can still lose weight. You can still improve your health. You can still lose body fat, even if you're not producing ketones. So, um, I guess from that sense, you don't necessarily need to measure it, but if you want to know if your diet is putting you in that fat burning mode, um, and in ketosis, 
then it makes sense to measure. And before we get into the level, let's talk about now the different ways to measure it. Let's get into the sort of the details. So what are the main ways people can measure their ketones? Sure. So um, as we talked about, there are three different ketone bodies, and each of the measuring methods is sensitive to a different ketone. So if we're talking about acetoacetate, uh, that's typically measured in the urine with urinary test strips. So there's a, a couple important things to consider about this. First of all, um, that's actually the excreted acetoacetate. So I like to think of it as kind of the excess acetoacetate that your body's not using that gets excreted in your urine, right? So it's not really a measure of the amount of ketones that's circulating in your body. It's more related to what your body's excreting. Um, also, because that measurement, um, uh, due to the nature of that measurement, it's actually semi-quantitative. So it gives you ranges, essentially. So if you look on the ketone strip, it tells you, I think there's maybe four or five different color ranges, and it can kind of give you a sense approximately of where you're at. Um, that's going to be sensitive to things like your level of hydration, like how long the urine has been in the bladder, stuff like that. Um, another effect of urinary ketone tests that people who have experience with testing know is that after a couple weeks of cutting carbs or doing calorie restriction, actually your urinary ketones drop, right? And that's be basically because your body becomes more efficient at using them. So it's not dumping them in your urine. So you still have the ketones circulating in your body and you're still using them, but you're no longer excreting them in the urine. So when, when people don't know this, they get very discouraged because like what happened, you know, after a couple of weeks, and it's actually a great sign when that happens. Um, it means your body's actually getting better at using the ketones, right? Yeah, but actually, you don't know. You don't know is your body getting better at using them or have you completely gone out of ketosis and I mean, not producing great, them anymore, right? Point. You can't tell. No, yeah. that, that, that's a great point, actually. I should have uh, I should have mentioned mm -hmm. that. But assuming that you're, you know, sticking to your diet and you're crushing right. it, um, your ketones may still drop after a few weeks. Yeah, so helpful in the beginning, helpful for beginners to to learn if you're if you're doing the right thing, making progress. Not so helpful over the long run as you as you sort of adapt to it, and not so helpful if you want to know your exact level rather than a general range. Exactly, that's a pretty good sum up. Okay, all right. So what about um, blood? Blood's the one people probably are most familiar with. Yeah, so blood tests are sensitive to that beta hydroxybutyrate mo molecule. So this is the BHB molecule. So there are a couple different, well, actually, there's a bunch of different meters out there that measure this. Um, and blood tests are generally uh, pretty accurate, right? Of course, they're measuring your blood ketones. Um, actually, taking a draw from your veins is more accurate. That's like a laboratory uh, ketone test. And there was a paper published, I, I can't remember if it was a year or two ago, it was pretty recent in the last couple of years, that basically showed quite a discrepancy between those two uh, sites, your venous blood and your capillary blood. Uh, but generally speaking, um, they're, they're pretty accurate measurements. Of course, there's, there's error in all these measurements. Um, but they work in a similar way to glucose strips where you take out a lancet with a needle um, and you prick your finger, you get a little drop of blood, put it on a strip, and you get your answer right away. Right. So blood tests uh, are, are pretty accurate ways to tell what your uh, ketone levels are. But of course, you have to draw blood. There's a lot of supplies involved and um, it's not the most convenient way. So just to just to clarify. So this when you prick your finger, that's the capillary. And when you get the blood test at the lab, that's the venous. So would you say the venous is the gold standard? Absolutely. OK. And then the capillary is generally felt to be equivalent. But you said there is some variation and is that also prone to, I don't know, hydration or where you prick or how much blood you get? Like, do those variables matter or are those less important for that? I think the primary one that matters, and I have to just admit that I'm not an expert on this, but um, I think the primary difference is where you draw the blood from is yeah. really where I think you're going to see the difference. I'm not so sure about the level of hydration in that. I haven't heard that as being a major factor. Uh, yeah, but I wouldn't think so. Yeah, but certainly where you draw the blood from can definitely make a difference. Okay. Now, and you were telling me about this. Well, we'll get into your study where people were doing finger pricks like 15 times a day for a number of <laughs> days. Like that, I can imagine that'd be problematic, but we'll get into that. So the, the next one then is the breath monitoring. So tell us about that. Sure. So a uh, breath ketone meters are sensitive to acetone. So that's the third uh, ketone body. Now, acetone is produced from a degradation of acetoacetate. So the acetoacetate is circulating in your blood along with the beta-hydroxybutyrate. And then 
there's a decay rate of that into acetone. Um, and then the acetone, because of its small size and it's a volatile molecule, it can actually diffuse into your lungs and then you exhale it out. Right. So it's a pretty cool process, actually. Um, it's very tricky to measure this accurately. I think that's the key point. Right. So you haven't heard a lot about breath acetone in the clinical context because it's very hard to measure accurately. So historically, the way that this has been done is with these big lab tools, mass spectrometer tools, where actually in the old days of, of clinical research on breath acetone, uh, subjects were breathing into bags and they were like running them off to the lab, right? That's the way that they were doing it. Um, so you can imagine that didn't produce a whole lot of data. It's hard to actually get good measurements that were a lot of good measurements that way. Yeah. Um, but essentially the way that it works is that the concentration of acetone in your breath increases as your exhale progresses. So basically, like you can think of it like taking a breath and inhale. And then when you start to exhale, most of what you're exhaling there is just ambient air, right? It's just the same air that you breathed in in the first place because it hasn't had the chance to interact with your lung tissue and actually exchange with the blood there, right? So, yeah, so from an anatomical standpoint, it's the, the air in your nose, your mouth, your trachea going into the very beginning part of your lungs. It hasn't mixed with your, what's called your alveoli sort of deep in your lungs. So it's very, it's a very different type of air. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, really the trick to doing um, accurate breath acetone sensing is to do deep, exactly what you said, deep lung sampling, right? So it's really just selectively pulling from that very last part of your breath. And that's going to make it not only more accurate because the, the levels that you measure are going to more accurately reflect what's in your blood, right? Because there is acetone circulating in your blood as well. Um, but also it's going to be more repeatable, right? You're going to be able to blow into the device a couple of times and get a very similar number. Okay. So historically, um, that type of sampling process was not developed. So a lot of the legacy breath acetone tools have simply not been accurate enough to use in a clinical setting. Um, the other um, issue historically with breath acetone is that uh, folks have been using um, basically like repurposed alcohol sensors. So the same type of sensor that you would use if, you know, that law enforcement would use. Um, and so that's like not very sensitive specifically to the acetone in your breath. Right. So that's the problem. A lot of people, if you, if you've had a drink within so many hours, um, it's going to give you false positives. Or even if you have like breath mints that might have certain things in them or alcohol that then, or cough medicine or whatever, all these things can give you false positive for breath meters. If it's that type of meter. Yeah, right? ex exactly. So a couple things really enable a technology to do this. Well, one is you want a highly selective acetone sensor over those other compounds that are in your breath. Cause there's thousands of compounds in your breath actually that you breathe out. And what we really want to do is just pick out the one. We really just want to know what's going on with acetone. And we, we want to really pick a sensor that doesn't respond well to those other compounds in your breath. That's the first thing. And secondly, we just want to sample that last part of your breath. It's that deep lung sample. So it's yeah. those two uh, pieces combined that really allow you to do accurate breath acetone sensing. Okay. And now when it comes to beta hydroxybutyrate and acetone, are they prone to the same problem with the acetoacetate, meaning as you uh, become more adapted and are utilizing your ketones better for fuel, uh, would you see a level drop or decrease despite no change in your diet, despite still, still doing everything right? That would make you say, wait a second, why are my levels decreasing if I'm doing everything right? Or, the, or is it not subject to that? So this is a great question. And actually, the answer is a bit involved. Um, and we've been having ongoing conversations with thought leaders in the space trying to work this out and understand this. Because we do see effects of levels of these different ketones changing as you become more, quote unquote, keto adapted. And trying to understand why is totally fascinating. So happy to talk about that here. Um, what people see is if you're looking at your breath acetone, first of all, let me just back up one step. Breath acetone is really a proxy for the acetoacetate in your blood, right? Because we mentioned before that um, acetone is formed when the acetoacetate degrades. So it degrades into acetone at more or less a fixed rate. And so it's kind of a proxy measurement for the acetoacetate in your blood, right? That's the one very important point to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, so what we see with folks who have been um, 
doing low carb for a while of, who have been in ketosis a lot is that their breath acetone is much higher than their BHB. So they'll be getting like the equivalent of like a four millimolar acetoacetate when they're sitting at like a 1.2 BHB. Mm -hmm. um, so what they do is they write into us and they're like, hey, uh, you know, I just pricked my finger and I'm, I'm getting a one and your meter says that I'm a lot higher than that. Why is that? And invariably, when we ask them how long they've been doing low carb or keto or have been in ketosis, it's always a long time. So there are really interesting reasons why that may be that we can get into, but that ratio of the acetoacetate to BHB in your blood is not a fixed ratio. It's actually controlled by enzymes and your body can turn that on or off. That conversion process between the two is actually regulated by enzymes in your body. So that's pretty confusing. So, yeah. <laughs> so for so for the person at home wanting to know how that affects them, I guess as long as you're sticking to one type of monitor and not trying to go between them, then for your relative gauge, it probably doesn't matter. But but if you're if you're used to doing a blood test and you switch to the breath test or vice versa, then maybe you need to sort of recalibrate what your normal is. Is that about right? Yeah, I think that that's about right. The only thing that I would add to that is that, um, you know, again, if you've been doing low carb or you've been in ketosis for a while, your blood meter may actually be underestimating your state of ketosis. That's okay. that's the one part that I would add to that. You might be yeah. in deeper ketosis than your blood meter is telling you. Yeah. So then let's talk about the value. So generally, you know, 0 0.5 millimoles is is where nutritional ketosis is said to start. And we can argue about whether that is an absolute cutoff or not, but it is probably not an absolute cutoff, but that's what we hear most of the times. And it can go up to 10 millimoles, which is usually, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis. So what, what do you, in your experience and in the research that you've seen, what do you think the sort of sweet spot, so to speak, is that, that people would want their ketones to be in when they're following a low carb diet and trying to get maximum fat burning? Yeah, good question. So as you mentioned, that transition into ketosis occurs at about uh, 0.5 millimolar if you're talking about a blood BHB meter, right? So if you're really just trying to um, maintain this metabolic flexibility and switch between this glucose burning state and this fat burning state, as long as you're transitioning through that 0.5 millimolar uh, cutoff, then you're probably accomplishing your goals right? If that's really your goal is to just kind of dip into ketosis and come back out and just kind of maintain that flexibility. There is some evidence that higher levels of ketosis are beneficial. Um, so the caveat behind all of this is that uh, these are primarily animal studies so far. So I'm going to put that disclaimer out uh, before I say anything else. Yeah. But, um, but those studies suggest that levels above one millimolar um, and sometimes as high as 1.5 millimolar can be beneficial uh, for things like anti-inflammatory effects, right? So yeah. um, ketones, BHB in particular, has some anti-inflammatory effects. It's a signaling molecule, and it can basically turn down some of the inflammatory pathways in your body, right? So it's not yeah. just a proxy for whether you're burning fat. It also has its own benefits for your health. Yeah, and that's a great point. I think that's important to make that there are sort of two ways to look at ketones. One, which we know a lot about, and I think the science is very well, um, very well evolved, is the marker for burning fat, the marker for low carb, low insulin as well. Um, and I think that's another important point we didn't bring up, that it's a marker of your insulin being low because you're accessing your fat stores. But sort of a very exciting area where the science is not as well um, it, not as well developed, but certainly developing on an almost daily basis, is the ketones themselves can be active molecules, signaling molecules, anti-inflammatory molecules. And that's where um, the use of a ketogenic diet for epilepsy, for cancer, for traumatic brain injury, for Alzheimer's, all these sort of emerging areas where well, aside from epilepsy, but these other areas where we don't have so much data, but there's a lot of excitement, a lot of promise, that might be where we really want to push the levels higher. Can you think of other areas where you might want to really push the levels higher? Yeah. The only other one that's uh, related to what you mentioned is um, the downregulation of certain oxidative stress, right? Which mm -hmm. has uh, implications for longevity. So some folks um, in the longevity space are really interested in that higher ketone level. So, um, you know, ketone levels around like the 1.5 millimolar, uh, 
And again, um, animal studies and there's some uh, proxy measurements for longevity. Um, but that data suggests that indeed levels of 1.5, 1.7 millimolar uh, can be beneficial for longevity as well. Yeah. So we've we've already sort of defaulted back to just talking about blood because that's where probably the most experience is and the most evidence is. Um, but you ran a study looking at uh, the the breath um, to see how that correlates and and to better quantify that. So give us a little bit of the details about this study um, and how tell us why it's important the things you learned about the breath monitoring. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we wanted to run this study because, as I mentioned, there wasn't a lot of data on this topic. Uh, primarily because of the breath acetone tools were all lab tools. So because we are able to do this with a portable breath acetone meter, we we're able to gather a lot more data. So what we did, this uh, trial was conducted in the fall of 2019. Uh, we had 20 people, we gave them a breath meter and we gave a portable breath acetone meter and we gave them an Abbott Precision Extra um, blood meter, right? So, um, they took, as you mentioned, quite a few measurements per day for two weeks. Um, we had them. How take, many was it? How many it was, was it? It was only five. It was not 15. Five. Okay. We're, <laughs> we're, we're not that brutal with them. Um, <laughs> That'd be pretty harsh. It was okay. pretty bad. It was already pretty bad. They were kind of begging for the end of the trial by the end of it. Um, had to rotate <laughs> fingers a lot, as you can imagine. Um, so we had them. Um, they were all trying to follow a low carb or ketogenic diet for the most part. Um, and then we just had them take five measurements a day. You know, they would sit down and they would take a blood measurement and a breath measurement and they would record the values and they would do that five times a day for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So um, what that produced is about 1300 data points, pairwise blood and breath data points. And historically, uh, to date, there were only about 540 um, up oh, wow. until that point with all the literature combined. So um, that produced about two and a half times the existing amount of data on that topic. Um, and not only that, but previous studies had not looked at the daily variability of ketones, which is really interesting and really important. And that's one of the most uh, interesting things that we found in the study is that ketone levels vary a lot during the day, just during a single day, right? Yeah, and right. So by how, how much, how much did you see the, them vary? So the average was about 50% actually, right? Wow. So if you're, you know, you're sitting there at one millimolar, right, then you could have a fluctuation of 0.5. Like, mm -hmm. in fact, that's the most common fluctuation uh, for somebody at that level. Um, so 50% is quite a bit of variability. And, you know, we're just starting to appreciate the sources and the causes of that variability, because yeah. again, we haven't been measuring this before. Um, but, you know, waking up in the morning and just taking, you know, sticking your finger or taking a breath measurement. Um, is really not capturing the full picture of the ketone exposure that your body's getting during the day for the vast majority of people. So you said you're you're still sort of figuring out what some of these details are that cause that variation. But so far, what have you learned so far? What are your theories? Because I think this would be interesting for people to know because if they test and they're at 1.0 and then they test again and they're at 0.5 or 0.6 and they're scratching their head trying to figure out what they did, what this means, what are some of the things they can on their checklist that they should see? Did I do this, this, or this that could explain the difference? Yeah, great question. So uh, the most obvious one is probably your diet, right? So something like a hidden carbohydrate in something that you're eating, right, is, is a big one. So if you're, you know, sitting there uh, in ketosis and then you eat something and a couple hours later you're totally kicked out, then I think it's a fair assumption that there was something in there that uh, was a hidden source of carbohydrate that kicked you out. Um, yeah. It could, of course, be something else, but that's awfully suspicious, right? <laughs> and we've had uh, people uh, write into us as well talking about that where it's like, oh, I had no idea there was sugar in this or that, right? It's amazing um, it just, where they can hide it. It's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? And uh, so th this is a very common experience is, uh, you know, hidden source of carbohydrates. Um, exercise certainly can affect it. Um, so typically exercise will increase your ketones over the course of, you know, several hours after. But interestingly, they can actually dip immediately after your exercise. Yeah. So is that part of the usage? Like you're using them up more, so they dip, but then your body is producing more to make up for that? And is that the uh, presumed physiology? I would assume we don't know for sure, but what, what's yeah. the level of evidence? Yeah, that's right. So I think that that's one effect. The other is um, cortisol um, that is a result of exercise is actually going to cause uh, your body to release glucose into your blood, 
right? Yeah, right. So right. when that happens, then um, your ketone production drops because your body basically detects that there's glucose in your blood. Um, so they can turn down your ketone production a little bit. So even if glucose goes up without insulin necessarily going up as much, you're still going to shut down your or lower your ketones a little bit. Oh, good question. I would imagine that the insulin would probably have to go up too, right? Because the insulin would keep the glucose from just going too high. So the insulin does go up a little bit. Yeah. Right. And the insulin is also um, going to regulate the ketone production, right? Like insulin glucagon regulation of ketone, right. which we don't, we don't need to get into, but I'm sure that there's also insulin involved in that as well. That's yeah. turning your ketones down. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we talked about carbs. We talked about exercise. Uh, what, what else is on that list that you can think of? Uh, circadian patterns, right? So yeah. folks see that when they wake up in the morning, their ketones are a lot of times lower. Now this is not the case for everybody. And actually this is a fascinating topic because some folks have lower ketone levels in the morning. Um, and some have higher ketone levels in the morning, just as a general pattern. And we, we mm -hmm. certainly don't understand that difference all the way. Uh, but one thing that could be causing low ketones in the morning is th again, the release of cortisol as your body wakes up and the attendant increase in blood glucose due to that. Um, since we're talking about cortisol stress, right? Yeah. Um, so some people who are like, I've kept my diet the exact same and, um, you know, I've done everything the same and my ketones are dropping. If you start to probe that sometimes, have you had any stressful events in your life lately? And, oh yeah, I just lost my job. Okay. Well that, that may be it. Right. Uh, for the exact same reason, like cortisol levels, um, causing a spike in your blood glucose. Um, so hormonal exercise, um, circadian patterns, uh, food, those are probably the first four that I would think about when trying to interpret patterns. All right. So that was a really interesting finding from that study that hadn't really been that hadn't really been shown very well in, in, in detailed science. So you guys showed this with your study and, and what else did you see about the correlation between the, uh, the acetone, um, measurements and the blood BHB levels? Yeah. So, um, the first thing to point out about this is since you can actually graph the two right alongside of each other, you can watch, you know, your blood ketones change right alongside your breath ketone. Right. So it's, it's very cool to, to look at some of these plots and they're in the paper that we publish um, a, a couple examples of that. Um, so the first thing you see is that they don't always change in lockstep. Right. So sometimes there's a little bit of a time delay between the way that the two change. So I'm talking a matter of like an hour or so, hour or two. Um, so if your blood ketones go up, a lot of times your breath ketones will follow behind that by like an hour or two. Right. Okay. So if you're doing just bare correlations between the two, that time delay between the way that they're changing is going to affect the correlation that you get. Right. Because your blood could have gone up, but your breath is maybe still low and hasn't caught up to it yet. Right. Um, so the bare correlation for blood and breath ketones is around 0.6, like R squared. Um, which is like a moderate correlation. So they've seen that um, in the past literature. We saw that in our trial. But if you actually look at the cumulative ketone exposure over the entire day, so now we're looking at a daily metric, not um, an individual point in time, the correlation is about 0.83, right? Oh. So this is, an, this is an excellent correlation. So what this means is we can kind of boil this down into plain language, is that if you were to take five blood measurements a day and five breath measurements per day, they're going to tell you almost exactly the same thing. They're going to indicate yeah. almost the exact same level of ketone exposure for that day. So that's interesting. So then it comes down to what are you really trying to learn? Are you trying to learn about what you did for your entire day and how that affected things? Or if you want to know specific things, this one meal, this one exercise, um, then based on what you said, it seems like if you're using a blood meter, you could test within, you know, 30 minutes of that activity, or even maybe like 15 minutes or five minutes of that activity to see what effect it had on ketones. But if you're using a breath meter, would you recommend delaying an hour based on what you said to see what that effect was? Is that? So actually, um, both ketones are going to take some time to respond to any, anything that you do, right? So the first thing to mention here is that glucose responds, or excuse me, ketones respond a bit more slowly than glucose. My mind went to glucose first. Um, so, you know, you see these CGM traces where like you eat a cookie and your glucose spikes like immediately, right? Ketones take a little bit longer um, to, to show up for those changes to show up. 
And the other thing is um, breath does not always lag behind blood. Sometimes it actually leads blood. So there are different situations where, and, and again, we're, we're sussing all this out, right? Because this is brand new science. Um, so we're not totally sure why that is, but it's not consistent that one goes before the other. Um, but you bring up a really interesting point, which is that if you're looking at cumulative exposure, right? If I want to know generally how I'm doing, I want to know how many ketones my body is seeing each day over the course of a week or a couple weeks, or I want to use that to track my weight loss, then that cumulative exposure is a great metric. If you're doing, if you're testing certain individual lifestyle choices that you're making, then at those individual points kind of before and after testing, for example, like I'll test my ketones before and then after a meal, those are great like spot checks, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, in order to capture, remember, in order to capture the variability in your ketones over the course of a day, you have to take somewhere in the three to five measurement range to really capture it. Okay. So that gets us back to sort of the pros and cons of these last two measurements, the blood and the breath. So with the blood, you get accuracy, you get relatively immediate feedback, although like you said, it's going to lag behind glucose. Um, but if you want multiple tests, it's multiple sticks. Um, and with the cost of the, of the lancets and the, and the strips, um, can you give us an idea of sort of what that cost is now? I know it's probably pretty variable, but are you up to date on, on the cost of some of the blood measuring devices? Yeah, I think so. I think really, as you mentioned, the, the primary cost is the variable cost associated with the strip. I think the meters themselves are like what, 30 bucks or something like that. Um, and then each strip is about a dollar. Right. Okay. So each time you use a strip, it's about a dollar. So if you figure a buck a day and you're doing, you know, three measurements a day, that's going to add up pretty fast. Right. Right. So the, so, uh, the downside, if you don't like blood, the downside of the cost, the downside of, of your fingers, uh, being sore. Um, so the breath meter gets away from that, um, because you don't need any blood. You don't need to prick your fingers, which is great. You can test as much as you want and there's no additional cost. Um, but the upfront cost tends to be more. So what, what's the upfront cost or the range for some of these, these higher quality breath meters? Um, in the hundreds of dollars. Um, so you're looking at somewhere in the, you know, 200 to $300 range typically for the high end breath meters. And okay. if you think about it, um, like I said, if you do the, the math on, you know, a three measurement per day with a blood strip, you can figure out for yourself how long that takes to pay for itself relative to blood strips. And it's not too terribly long. Yeah. All right. So, so those are the benefits. You can test as much as you want. You get, um, feedback for many different times a day. Um, no muss, no mess, which is kind of nice. But one of the downsides has been one concern about accuracy and two, not being specific again, sort of giving a range. So, uh, I guess there are a number of different, um, specific devices on the market now, some that can give a specific level and some that give a range. Tell us what you know about some of the differences um, among the way devices report um, the measurement and what their accuracy might be. Yeah. So I do think you're onto something really important about the ranges. So typically when you see devices that offer ranges, um, most devices wouldn't offer a range if they could offer something more specific, right? So usually it's a matter of like, this is kind of what the resolution of the device is. So typically devices are going to report down to their best resolution, right? So if you can resolve, you know, four different levels of breath acetone, you're going to report four different levels. If you can resolve 40, you're going to do that, right? Because people would always want something that's more specific, provided that you can put that number into context. So um, the way that you get specific with these numbers, we had mentioned a couple of them before, these sampling, these advanced sampling methods to really pull from your deep lung these highly selective sensors, um, actually isolating the sensor from the surrounding air. Uh, because something that you'll notice in some of these devices is you can actually see the sensors, which means that um, as the acetone from your breath is passing over them, it's mixing with the outside air in a way that is not controlled, right? So, you know, if you get a draft from a, from your AC vent or something that blows in there one time, it might totally change your reading. Um, so that's the other thing that I didn't mention before, in addition to the sampling and the selective acetone sensor, is actually having a sealed and housed um, sensor uh, environment, right? Where you're only looking at the acetone and you're locking out all the outside stuff. 
Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Okay. So now that we've sort of gone through the three different types of testing and the pros and cons, what do you think the future holds for ketone testing? What do you think is like on the horizon that would be the next the next great uh, monitor or the next great advancement? Or are we sort of like as good as it's going to get? What do you think? Yeah, I think something that's going to become really interesting is the data itself, right? So if you can start to gather this high frequency ketone data and we basically start to build a data set about people's fasted state metabolism, I think a whole world opens up for us, right? A whole world involving different treatments and nutritional interventions for different conditions where we can basically say, you know, look, we'll help you keep your ketones to a certain level. Or we know that if you keep your ketones to a certain level, that you're going to see outcome X, Y, Z improve, right? And we'll actually be able to be a little bit more prescriptive with folks and actually help them achieve those levels, right? And kind of guide them on that journey. And so I think what's really exciting about the prospect of high frequency, high density ketone data is that, is really being able to build out some of these nutritional inter interventions to be real interventions, right? Because the first line treatment for things like type, type, type two diabetes are always lifestyle changes, right? But right. it's hard to actually do that, right? It's hard to, to, achieve and sustain lifestyle changes without feedback about how your body's doing, right? So I think there's this, this big psychological effect here of getting the feedback about, hey, I did something and I'm moving in the right direction right now, right? An hour later, yeah. two hours later, this isn't something you have to wait a week for uh, to see the result on the scale. You actually get a result an hour or two after you make a decision. And yeah. I think the, uh, the reinforcement of that is really going to drive some of these nutritional interventions in areas like you mentioned, like diabetes, like Alzheimer's, uh, other neurodegenerative diseases. Cancer now is a really interesting topic as well. Um, so all these different areas that use nutritional interventions, being able to provide that feedback in order to drive adherence to nutritional protocols and actually achieve better outcomes as a result. Yeah, that's really interesting. And there, there are two important points there that I want to rehash. And, you know, I, I frequently say that we don't have evidence to say for, you know, just general health, metabolic health or weight loss that a, a, a level of two is better than a level of 0.5. And like, it's probably all the same based on the evidence we have. But the evidence we have is usually one finger stick per day. So what you're saying is getting these high frequency measurements may change that entire thing. Like we don't know. We actually don't know that. So that would be really interesting um, to to know if that if the higher levels are better and measuring the higher levels with more accuracy and consistency. I think that would be really interesting to see some of those studies. But the second point is the feedback, and that's one of the things I think about CGMs. You know, CGMs are great to learn how food affects your body. Um, but then once you learn that, then it's sort of like your accountability partner because you know you're going to see the response. If you eat something you're not supposed to or, you, you know, that, that's going to affect your blood sugar adversely, you're going to see that response. And it could be the same with the ketones. If you know if you eat this and your ketones are going to drop, now it's your feedback mechanism, your accountability partner. So that's really interesting. Do you think one day we might have a, a CKM, a continuous ketone monitor to go along with our, we'll have our CGM on one side or CKM on the other side. And like, they'll duel it out. Like, is that coming? Do you think? Um, it's not clear. So there are definitely people who are working on this. It's tricky to do that uh, for a variety of reasons that we probably don't have time to talk about today, but certainly it could happen. I think the important thing to keep in mind with the CGM versus like a CKM or like a pseudo continuous ketone monitor, like a breath meter Mm -hmm. is that um, they're kind of complementary, right? So um, let's say that you ate a bunch of glucose and then you started fasting, right? So you start off with a high blood glucose level and then you just stop eating. So what you're going to see on your CGM is you get the big spike because you just ate a bunch of carbohydrate and then that's going to slowly drop as your body uses that glucose, right? Eventually your glucose is going to flatline. You know, typically this happens down in the 80, below 80 range, right? Mm -hmm. um, at that point, your body then starts burning through your glycogen. And when it gets through that, then your ketones start increasing, right? So it's just important to, to recognize that these are kind of complementary tools that are looking at different parts of your metabolism. So CGM is looking at your fed state metabolism and ketone monitors are looking at your fasted state metabolism, right? And if we're yeah. talking about switching between the two, they kind of do this little handshake around when your uh, glycogen is depleted, right? Right. 
um, when your CK or CGM, now I'm getting confused, CGM flatlines, and then your ketones start going up. Right. So, so you mentioned fasting. So, you know, the ketones obviously go up with a low carb diet or with fasting. So, um, it seems like the higher levels of ketones come from fasting. So are you aware of any data or experiments on that showing like sort of what the general range is for nutritional ketosis and how that's different from fasting um, ketosis? Uh, you know, I've seen graphs that that show what the general areas are, but is there any data really to, to sort of support what the averages are? I'm not really sure about that. I do think that people, I mean, folks that we see, their numbers are typically highest when they're fasting, as you say, yeah. right? So the highest, highest numbers come from people who are generally eating a ketogenic diet and then they start fasting, right? Because their numbers yeah. are already elevated. And then when they start fasting, they really become elevated. Um, yeah. So I think you're right. I think you essentially nailed it. Yeah. So do you see many levels like above five? I mean, is it pretty uncommon for you to see levels above five, even with fasting? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think, you know, uh, a four is kind of the maximum that we see typically. Um, five, I think one of the blood meters might go up to six something. That's like very rare. You know, we haven't seen that. We didn't see that at all in our trial. But um, yeah, we were definitely up in the low fours in our trial, for example. So, and actually, so let's talk about um, accuracy at the different ends, sort of at the bookends, because... Um, like the history of these devices was probably geared more towards making sure you don't go too high, you know, making sure you're not in diabetic ketoacidosis. And they've sort of been refined now to say, let's see if you're in the lower end, you know, if you're, if you're in just getting into ketosis, is there any difference in blood versus breath in, in like the different bookends, whether they're better at the, the 0.3 to 0.5 or better between the 3.5 and four? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. So with the blood, I'm not positive, but I think they're typically percent errors on that. So what you'll see if you're up in the two range is the absolute error is going to be bigger. It might be 0.4 or something. So you might be at a two when you're reading a 2.4, for example. Mm -hmm. And then at the low end with those same percentages, you might be 0 0.1, 0 0.2 off, um, depending. The big thing there with the blood meters is actually the strips. So we have done some QA on some of the different blood meters. And what we found is that the strips are really what make the difference there because that's where the chemical reaction happens. Um, so strips that are sealed, like individually packaged, perform much better. Um, oh, and it's, it's just because they stay cleaner. They're, they're just cleaner. It's a cleaner surface to have a, a chemical reaction on. So that's just something to look yeah. out for if you're considering blood meters. Um, as far as the breath goes, you can really design them to be sensitive at either end, depending on what your um, depending on what your use case is. So at least um, the breath meters that we've saw seen and the ones that we've had experience with, for example, the one in our trial, that's really designed to be highly sensitive at the low end. Um, it was designed to assist with a type two diabetes reversal for low carb diets for type two diabetes. Um, and what's really interesting about that low end sensitivity is that you can resolve um, very small steps at the low end so you can tell folks if they're moving in the right direction, even if they're not quite in ketosis yet, which is a very beneficial psychological effect, right? Because I think if you just see like zero, 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 and then all of a sudden you're in ketosis, the whole time you're getting zero, it's frustrating, right? You feel like you're not making right. any progress. Whereas if you could see that kind of creep up slowly, again, even though you're not quote unquote, in ketosis yet, but you can still see it increasing. That's very beneficial for people who are starting off. So um, that low end sensitivity is important for beginners, especially. That's great. Uh, that's interesting to know. All right. Well, I think we've really unpacked a lot about um, ketone monitoring from the basics to some of the more complex issues. Uh, was there other things about the monitoring that you think are important to discuss? Um, and also sort of how would you sum up advice if someone's looking for, you know, different ketone monitors, what they should be looking for. So sort of two questions there, sorry to overwhelm you with two questions at once, but. Sure. So uh, I think it really depends on your goal. So if you are um, interested in getting personalized feedback about the decisions that you're making to really try to understand and kind of take this to the next level, as it were, and kind of peer inside your body and kind of understand what's going on, I do think monitoring is very important and very insightful. Right. And, and for all the reasons that we've discussed, right, the fact that your body may not respond in the same way uh, to others. So I do think it's kind of a, 
a way to um, to just get more insight into what's happening to kind of target your activities, right? So that you're no longer kind of grasping at straws. Because I think there's so much frustration about, you know, dieting, right? That has like such this bad rap is like, do I want to try this diet or that? And I think the really important thing about ketone monitoring to understand is it is diet agnostic, right? I think people think about ketones as being part of a ketogenic diet and they need not be restricted to a ketogenic diet. As we talked about before, anytime your body's burning fat, no matter how it gets there, no matter how you put your body in that state, you're going to get ketones. So maybe a ketogenic diet works for you. Maybe another diet works better than that. But the way to actually tell is to monitor yourself, right? Is to actually do this testing to understand what's working for you. So I do think um, that probably is, I'm trying to answer both questions at once, actually. <laughs> I would just want to point out that ketone monitoring is not specific to the ketogenic diet. It tells you if you're burning fat. Yeah. So that could be another thing too. I mean, it's just, it's role in fasting. So, you know, a lot of times people have questions, how long do I have to fast to really get a benefit? And so if you're not on a ketogenic diet and you want to try intermittent fasting, that could be a great tool just to say, all right, at what level of fasting, what duration of fasting have you now gone into ketosis and started fat burning? Um, that could be really useful too for people who aren't following a ketogenic diet. So that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's a great point, Brett. I'm glad you brought that up because we actually conducted a study a couple of months ago about this because uh, we were curious how long it would take folks to hit a certain level of ketosis. So we set this target of 15 um, on on uh, the breath meter that we were using. That's about 1.5 in the blood. Mm -hmm. Um, so how long is it going to take people once they start fasting, start the clock and see how long it takes people to hit that, that 1.5 level. And we yeah. saw this enormous range of times, right? We got everywhere from six hours to 60 hours. Wow. Right. And it all, when you started to kind of dig into the data a little bit, there's some demographic effects there, uh, probably not enough data to be able to say for sure. But we also had people log their meals before they started fasting. And there's such a correlation between what people are eating before they started fasting and the time it actually takes them to get the benefits of fasting. So right? the higher carb their diet, the longer it took, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, the 60-hour person, I think, had like ice cream right before they started or something, <laughs> right? So, so I do think like fasting is, is great because it's simple. And people can kind of understand, hey, there's just this window of time when I'm not allowed to eat and it's easy to follow. But, you know, that time window might not be appropriate to you based on what you're doing, based on your own body, and then also what you're doing outside of that window. So I think it kind of ties it all together that, you know, fasting is not necessarily a silver bullet if you're eating a bunch of ice cream outside of that period, right? You may never be deple depleting your glycogen at all. Uh, when you're fasting, if you're not eating reasonably well outside of that window. So this idea of time-based fasting versus like ketone level based fasting is something yeah. that we're, we're really interested in. Yeah. So are there more studies coming? Like where can we, so where can we hear more about you, learn more about what you're doing and, and access these studies? Because I think this is such interesting science that, that really isn't so well known or talked about. Yeah, so our study, um, I suppose we could link to it um, somewhere and when we post the podcast, but um, yeah. our study is published in PRJ, so we can link to that. And there's a lot of reference studies about um, breath acetone and ketone levels. Um, also, our website, mybiosense.com, has a lot of this mm -hmm. information in it. Um, and then, you know, just keep an eye out, right? Because we're, uh, we have a lot of clinical research collaborations and we're... Uh, the meters in a lot of different clinical studies around the country at leading academic institutions. And we're just starting to uncover the science and the implications and what it can mean for new treatments for these different conditions. So it's, it's a very exciting time. So definitely keep your eyes peeled. Yeah, great. Well, I look forward to seeing a lot more from you. And I always get excited about new science and new applications of science. So I think this is going to be pretty cool coming down in the future. So thanks for taking the time and thanks for going through all this with, with us. And um, appreciate all you're doing. Thanks so much, Brad. Appreciate it.